Okay, uh, so good morning, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I would uh, like to introduce myself and also talk today about uh, the Cambridge cluster case study in the biotech sector. I want to thank Dr. Abdullah Akil for the support of this presentation and thank the CACS in Medina, the Prime Minister of the Science and Technology Academy of 1932. على قبول هذه الدعوة وأشكر جمعية الابتكار والبحث العلمي على تنسيق وأشكر الجميع اليوم على الحضور أحب أعرف بنفسي أنا الدكتور عبد الرحيم جامعة الأستاذ مساعد في جامعة الخليفة في أبو ظبي I've been يعني involved in biotech يعني research Uh, the last past, I think, about uh, seven to eight years, in the Emirates, in Saudi Arabia, in Britain, in Cambridge. Um, so hopefully, I could uh, uh, I give you uh, an eye insight within this area, and also like uh, use Cambridge as an example um, to see what we can learn and what uh, and what we can't learn. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so, just a, uh, a little bit background about myself. So, I'm originally from uh, Jeddah, from Saudi Arabia. I did my uh, training, my master's in stem cell biology in the medical school in Minnesota. Then I did my PhD and postdoc in Cambridge between 2016 and 2017. Then I moved uh, to Khalifa University to start my lab, which works on stem cells. Regenerated medicine on RNA molecules, synthetic, and these kind of things. Okay, <clears throat> so also I was also um, involved in um, in some entrepreneurship uh, training in Cambridge as well. So I was involved in uh, in the Judge Business School Accelerate Program. Um, I also worked with Google Campus in, in London for, on on a couple of biotech startups. An idea space in Cambridge, also in the biotech uh, sphere as well. I was also um, the and I won the, the award of the first innovation entrepreneurship competition for Saudi students in 2015. That was arranged uh, in in, the, in in London. Uh, so I kind of I'm quite familiar with the ecosystem, with the biotech ecosystem in the UK, especially in Cambridge. And today I'm going to talk about that ecosystem, things that I've learned and things that I have seen that's working. Uh, of course, I'm not trying to say that we should be like Cambridge, right? I'm not trying to say that um, that we need to um, become uh, or like uh, imitate their ecosystem. Every cluster, every country, every city, every uh, university have their own ecosystem that is kind of built organically. And today, I'm I just want to highlight a couple of things that we can learn from and hopefully maybe um, facilitate our own ecosystem in the Gulf. Okay, uh, so I, want, I would like to start with, uh, with, with this idea is that bio, biotechnology, our biotech in general, the industry, is a, is a strategic necessity, is a, is a necessity in the Gulf, right? In Saudi Arabia, in the UAE, in the whole Gulf. So it's not something that it's a lot of people think that biotech is something that is, um, you know, it's an extra, right? So it's not it's not required. It's not a requirement, but actually biotech is a requirement. It's, it's a strategic requirement as well. And I'm going to give you guys an example how it became uh, evident, like it, it became an example how biotech is important and it's a strategically important. So we all remember what uh, happened, uh, I mean, a couple of year, years ago, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, every country was closed down, people were, um, were, um, were locked in homes, and people had to do routinely checks to detect if they're infected or if they're not infected. And that required a, a procedure that, that everyone is familiar with now, as we call it the qPCR, the PCR, that we used to take nasal swabs, uh, our buckle swabs uh, to do it on a routinely basis. Okay, so during the pandemic, in the in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, a lot of countries like the U.S. and the U.K. and other 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 countries that were um, basically producing something that we call uh, reverse transcriptase. So this is an enzyme, 
uh, that comes from the HIV virus. So let me just um, highlight the, the COVID, the SARS-CoV-2. So this was the virus that caused COVID-19. Uh, so it's, its genomic material is made from RNA. And the problem with RNA is it's an unstable molecule. It needs to be converted or um, reversed into DNA. And the only, uh, the only enzyme that does that is an enzyme that we call reverse transcriptase. And that actually comes from the HIV virus. And a lot of companies in the US and the UK and other uh, countries in the world, they generate that and we buy them here in the Gulf and other countries buy them like, the, like Japan as well. Uh, and this and the and DNA then, the cDNA is used for detection in the qPCR. So a lot of countries in the beginning of the pandemic actually locked down on, on selling reverse transcriptase because they, they felt that it was, it was a strategic uh, molecule, a uh, reagent, that they couldn't sell to other countries. And um, so there is a huge shortage of this enzyme um, and uh, countries were, were, were left kind of alone to kind of figure out where, where to get this enzyme if they wanted to, to do PCRs to, to kind of control, control the virus. And if it, if it wasn't for a lot of them, China, um, that uh, massively produced this enzyme and, 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 and supported other countries, then a lot of countries would have been in, in a very tight position because they didn't have the biotechnology to produce the enzyme in home, right? So they didn't, they didn't have the expertise, they didn't have uh, the, the, the technology to pr produce the enzyme in, in home. Uh, and other examples exist as well. So insulin production is a, is a strategic um, uh, molecule because a lot of people rely on it, uh, type 1 diabetes, people rely on it to, to actually live on a daily basis. Uh, a lot of drugs, a lot of vaccines, especially the new ones like the mRNA vaccines, um, novel therapies, like in cancer, something that we call targeted therapies, um, um, gene therapy as well, cell therapy. So all these biotech-based um, uh, therapies, uh, guess example. They are they're very they're very good examples how biotech the biotech industry, uh, a successful biotech industry, is is a strategic requirement for for countries. Okay, so I just wanted to make that point very clear. Okay, so today we're going to talk about Cambridge, the University of Cambridge, the city of Cambridge as, an, as a case study example. And I'm quite familiar with that ecosystem because I, I was there for about five to six years and I continuously visit and um, work with the ecosystem there in Cambridge. Um, and I've seen a lot of things um, fail. I've seen a lot of things work. And, and, and you kind of get a sense and feeling of the ecosystem. How is it working? Uh, how is it built? And we're going to talk about a couple of things today. So just about, just to start with, with numbers, is that the, the and, and, and this is just to show how successful the ecosystem is in, the, in a small city like Cambridge. And where the, where the population is barely 100,000, maybe, maybe 200,000 individuals. Uh, okay, so um, so the university actually this is a, a, a new report. It was published uh, last year, uh, and 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 it and it basically showed that the university contributes thirty billion uh, pounds to the UK economy, and it creates uh, more than eighty six thousand jobs across the UK. And, and this is a yearly basis, right? So this is in a yearly basis. Uh, so I just put a number there. So this is about 150 billion Saudi rials uh, that one university is contributing to the economy of the UK. Okay, so it's quite uh, substantial. So when you break that down, you actually find that the majority of the of that money comes, or the the majority of the funds actually come from from research, right? So it's from the from the, from the exchange activities like commercial companies, spin-outs, um, yeah, spin um, um, so commercial activity that's carried out around the university. This is what makes up more than, than I would say, maybe more than 80% of, of, of the funds that, that the university contributes to the economy of the UK. And then there are also a couple of other numbers, uh, student activities, tourism activities, uh, these are all the other things that the universities contribute to, uh, but I just wanted to highlight that the majority of the money is coming actually from um, from 
from the commercial activity, from uh, you know, like relying on the ecosystem that's present in, 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 in Cambridge to kind of facilitate the research into the translational side, into, into using it in the real life, in the real world. Okay, so uh, today we're talking about uh, the biotech um, and there is this really nice um, uh, principle that, uh, that we like to talk about a lot uh, which is the triple helix uh, requirement for any ecosystem, uh, which is the research institutions, basically the creation of knowledge. And then we also have the private sector, which is basically the facilitators uh, of that knowledge, transforming it into, into products or into companies. And, um, and then we have also the policy making, right? So the, these are three um, core uh, requirements that need to work together. So the flow between them needs to kind of go like water uh, for any, any ecosystem to, to flourish and any ecosystem to, to basically be successful. Uh, so these are just a couple of uh, examples in, in the small city of Cambridge, and this is now focusing on the biotech sector. So the biotech sector alone contributes to about seven billion uh, pounds uh, of, of uh, into the UK economy, Cambridge cluster, we call that. Uh, this was in 2019. So it's about 35 billion sorted reals. This is just in one year, right? So it's a very good target. It's a very good number to have. And I wanted to highlight some of the, the infrastructure, right? Some of the biotech infrastructure that is away from the university's infrastructure. So the university, of course, has its own research labs, its, its departments, its uh, research centers. And, and, and I think the, the, the secret to, to, to the biotech successfulness in Cambridge is the clusterness, is to bring very similar people or similar minded people close to each other. This is why we call it the Cambridge cluster. And I think that's, that's what makes uh, Cambridge and, and a lot of other cities like Oxford or uh, Boston or, or maybe um, the Bay Area as well, California, very successful is this idea of clustering, bringing people uh, near each other, right? And then you just leave up, people do what they do best and, and you'll get a lot of good ideas and, and also good products. And uh, so I was just going to highlight some of uh, the infrastructure that is away from the infrastructure of the university. And these are in place to kind of speed up this idea of research moving into, into products, into companies or into. Um, so they're not, they're not incubators, they're not accelerators, but there are very similar ideas uh, of clustering, right? So they cluster research areas, but the idea is then for uh, a translational side. Of course, Science Parks are, are, are examples of those. We also have the Wellcome Genome Campus, uh, which, which the human genome uh, sequencing was done part in the Sanger Sequencing Institute. We also have the Milner uh, Therapeutic Institute. This is a, a very new institute. Uh, and basically what they do is they kind of, um, they kind of facilitate the, uh, the, the drug production um, and basically relied on research and tried to facilitate it. So I, I took this uh, quote from their website. It's uh, as a biomedical institute, we act as a catalyst and driver forming dynamic partnerships to unlock the power of emerging discoveries. Okay, so a lot, so a lot of the times scientists, uh, they're kind of focused on science and the business people are focused on their business people and there's no partnerships between them. Right? And there's a lot of opportunities that are missed and lost because of that. So this Miller Therapeutic Institute that I'm quite familiar with, uh, they act like a catalyst uh, and, and they are doing really good things now. And of course, there's, uh, there's other examples as well. Um, so this is just an example about the biotech uh, infrastructure in Cambridge. Of course, there's many others, many good other examples. But I think the take home message here is the idea of clustering, uh, clustering and partnerships. I think that's between academic world and, and the industry as well. Okay, uh, so uh, after, after that partnerships come, so after the infrastructure, so the, the huge investment in research and the appetite of, of waiting quite a long time, uh, Cambridge uh, is an 800 year old university, so they kind of waited and learned uh, from their mistakes for quite a long time. 
Um, there's this phenomenon that then happens in the biotech industry or in the biotech world where companies start to be attracted uh, to uh, areas where there's a lot of good research coming out, right? And, uh, and AstraZeneca is a good example. Uh, and I'm not sure, maybe some of, some of you have visited Cambridge before. You, you, when, when, you, when you enter the city now, you see this big campus that is um, specially uh, made and designed just for AstraZeneca, which is a huge biotech company. So this is a private sector, private arm that acts like a, um, an accelerator, basically uh, utilizing the research that's taking place in Cambridge and a city like Cambridge and using it and speeding up. And the, the, their activities. And um, I, have, I have a quote from the CEO of AstraZeneca. And this is a, a case study because this, this happened uh, recently that uh, AstraZeneca invested a lot of millions of pounds in, in, in the city. They also built their own research center as well there. And so the idea is that they want to be close to the researchers, close to the uh, the research that's taking place in the city and then contribute, learn, and then transform in, into products that, that they'll sell later on. So this is something as, uh, as a quote from the CEO, he says, as a global uh, biopharmaceutical business, we have an ambition to follow the science. Okay, so I think that's that's really the, the take home message from, from any private sector that our biotech private sector that wants to move into a city or that wants to grow into an area is that they follow the science, okay? And then they push later on for, for discoveries later on. So uh, so I think like uh, the take home message is that the, the genuine science or the abundant amount of science that is produced, generated, um, then attracts the private sector to these clusters. And then these private sectors then facilitate and move things much faster later on. Um, <clears throat> yeah, boundaries of what known today and deliver innovative, life-challenging medicine. Uh, and, and, and I think that resonated with me a lot. And I was really keen on, 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 on talking about that today, which is the idea that they follow science. Okay, so the idea of following science. And we also have other, uh, other tech companies, biotech companies in the U.S. that do very similar. And, in Harvard and Stanford and in very similar areas of, uh, and elsewhere as well. So this is, a, this is their AstraZeneca Discovery Center. So they invested heavily into the city and invested in infrastructure and, and they're working with, with the science community there to facilitate anything that they think can move as products, you know, the, to really work as a biotech um, <clears throat> facilitator there. Okay, so this was a really good case study that people are looking at now, AstraZeneca in Cambridge, and I also wanted to talk about it today. Okay, <clears throat> um, so this is uh, uh, social capital is, is a very good example in Cambridge. This was a study done in, in, in the city of Cambridge because, I mean, the successfulness of, of the cluster, of the innovation and the research and commercialization cluster in Cambridge it's successful that people are, are kind of studying why is it working, right? So they're trying to look at it from an academic academic point and see what are the main points that um, make it very successful. And, and according to some reports, it's, it's one of the most successful clusters in the world today. It's the number one uh, innovative cluster. And so people are looking at why is it working? Why is, why is it successful? Um, and one of the key <clears throat> elements is something that they call social capital. And we also have this in, in, in our culture, but I don't think anyone has look, looked into it this uh, in a scientific point of view. Okay, so, so what they did was they looked at all the companies, uh, either biotech or tech or whatever tech companies that you can think about that has been produced in Cambridge for the last couple of years. And they looked at, so they're not looking at the founders, they're actually looking at the investors here. Okay, so, so it's the idea of innovation, commercialization, uh, and uh, innovation research. And then there's also this idea of, of investment uh, on top of all that, uh, private investment. So they looked at all the investors um, that invested in all these companies over the years, and they actually found a link between them. Okay, so they so they found that 
that these individuals are the main investors that all of them invested in most of the companies that spinned out from in Cambridge are from Cambridge. So they put them all in, in their names. So these are all uh, VC investors are um, sometimes they're, they're private investors, um, angel investors. Um, so they put them all there. And then they started to, to look for investors that work together. Okay, so uh, and then they start to have the, this what they call the social capital network. So you see here, this dotted, dotted lines are investors that work together only in one project. And then the, uh, the, the, the orange is when you have two links. So two investors worked uh, to support one uh, company. And then you have three, then you have four. And basically, what this what this figure of social network is the capital is telling you is that if you if if you are a researcher or if you have an idea or you or you want to open a company and you're in this Cambridge cluster, you don't need to go to all the investors. You don't need to speak with all the investors. You just need to speak with one investor that he that you can gain the trust of one investor, right, and then. As, as a result, you get this social capitals, you get this trust of other investors that have invested with him before that are more inclined to invest in your company as well. So <clears throat> it gives you an idea that you don't need to approach every investor. You need to just gain the trust of one investor. And then <clears throat> as a result, many investors would come, uh, which, it will, which are within the social capital network. Uh, to basically support your company to spin out or to kind of become successful. So it's, it's a very nice idea and, it's, and this is what's called social capital and I'm pretty sure we have something similar, um, but maybe, maybe it hasn't been um, uh, illustrated this way. Okay, <clears throat> policy making as well. I mean, we talked about the, the triple helix um, principle is that you have the research, you have the private sector, and then you have the policy making. And <clears throat> Policy making is extremely important because you can have, especially in the biotech world, and I'll give you an example in the US a couple of, uh, so it was uh, in Bush, in the Bush administrator time, uh, the Bush administration actually uh, prohibited, they actually banned um, most of the, of the embryonic uh, stem cell research. So a lot of the researchers, a lot of a lot of the research in human stem cells actually moved from the U.S. to the U.K. and Japan and, 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 and basically other areas. And then when uh, Barack Obama uh, took into administration, he actually, one of the first thing he did was to change uh, the policy and make human uh, stem cell research allowed. And, and, and then the U.S. flourished and became one of the, the leading countries now in human uh, stem cell research. So you see, it wasn't. It wasn't that the U.S. didn't have the the, the, the money, it didn't it didn't have the research, it didn't infrastructure, the private sector. It was a problem of policy making. So policy making is a very important uh, concept in, in, in the industry, especially in the biotech industry. And and there are some challenges. And and I take this quote from the uh, the the vice uh, chancellor of of the, of the university, Cambridge where he says that <clears throat> we rely on evidence. So the evidence provided by the business research team helps us understand what is going on in the local and regional eco uh, economies and provide an invaluable input into our decision making, right? So basically what, what he's saying is that we, we make policies, we make decisions that affect um, the biotech industry or whatever industry based on uh, science, based on evidence that's being provided. So what is working, what is not working, this, this idea of social capital. So if you have a social capital network, then the next thing you want to do is, is facilitate entrepreneurs with that network, right? That way you have more companies spinning out. And there's this idea of clustering communication. So policy making is a very important area in the, in the biotech industry. Okay, so as a result, again, we're using Cambridge as, as a case study, as an example. There's so many other uh, things we haven't talked about. I mean, we just have 30 minutes to cover today. Um, so as a result, the, uh, the, the city of Cambridge now is actually uh, competing with the U.S. Um, in the biotech industry. 
So there are many biotech uh, companies that are becoming uh, successful and homed in, in the city. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any of them today. I just wanted to give an example that there are other companies that are uh, that have started up there and they're doing really good. They're invest, um, attracting a lot of money and they're doing a lot of good science and a lot and they're producing a lot of products um, th that that are helping with the biotech uh, companies. Um, there's one more thing that I just want to cover before we finish today, which is the idea of innovation versus imitation. And I think that if we look at the, the Chinese example, um, before they went into the idea of innovation in the biotech uh, industry, they kind of uh, relied on imitation. Uh, so they spent about, I think, 20 years imitating, the so imitating basically bringing, homing in the technology, training in the human, what we call human capital. And, and, and only now, in this last past five years, they, have, they started to become leaders in, into the innovation. Now, I mean, it, this could be an example for, um, for China, uh, this idea of uh, imitation versus uh, innovation. But it's a very nice example how in, in the biotech industry that sometimes uh, imitation can lead to innovation. Okay, I think we're done with today. Um, thank you for your time. I wish I had more time to talk about today, but I had only 30 minutes. So thank you so much.